Welcome and good evening, everyone. I am so okay. Sorry, uh, technical problem. Welcome and good evening, everyone. My name is EJ Klein. I am the president and CEO of Keshet, and I am so thrilled to welcome you tonight. Um, so as you know, we are not going to be cooking together tonight, but we are going to be learning together. We'll be getting to know Jake Cohen and Keshet. We'll be playing a game with the chance to win a copy of Jake's book, Jew-ish, Reinvented Recipes from a Modern Mensch, a cookbook by Jake Cohen. Lastly, I know that everyone is going to ask, so yes, this program is being recorded. We'll put it on our YouTube channel and send out a link along with the recipe that Jake will be cooking from this evening, and we'll send that to you next week. And now, I am so delighted to welcome Jake Cohen. Jake is a cookbook author and a nice Jewish boy from New York City. He's a former food staffer at Saver, a food editor of Tasting Table, a restaurant critic of Time Out New York, and editorial director of The Feed Feed. I just love saying that, The Feed Feed. Jake wrote his first book, Re, uh, Jew-ish, Reinvented Recipes from a Modern Mensch, about his love of modern Jewish cooking and baking. Last I checked, it was at number seven on the New York Times bestseller, look, bestseller list. Mazal tov and kol hakavod to you, Jake. And so now I am thrilled to welcome Jake Cohen. Jake. He's coming, don't worry. Hi. Hello. So How's nice to see you. Good. Pleasure. So, um, Jake, let's start with, tell us what you're cooking tonight. So, um, I actually have an extra surprise just because it was like going to be a full meal, but we were doing one of my favorite recipes from the book, which is the um, Iraqi roasted salmon, um, which is a really, 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 really just like easy, comforting family recipe that I learned from my mother-in-law. And to go with it, I'm making some toddy. So we'll, we'll get a little bits of that on the side if there's time, um, but just everyone always loves a little crispy uh, Persian rice action. But uh, shall we get into it? Yeah, so let's get into it. And um, so everyone, what's going to happen is Jake's going to start cooking and he'll be explaining what he's doing, of course, as he goes. Um, and we'll be interspersing amidst the cooking some questions for Jake um, so that you can get to know him. Love it. I'm a great multitasker. Wonderful. So just like keep it going. We got the counter cam. Um, so I'm just going to heat in a skillet, three tablespoons of olive oil. And we're going to just start cooking down some onions and scallions. And really, this is like, we're making a sauce to go over salmon. You can really use this on any protein, any fish. You can do it on chicken, tofu. Um, and we're really just like balancing acidity, spice, and sweetness. So the sweetness is going to be coming from a lot of caramelized onions. The acidity is going to be coming from lemon and tomato, and then the spice is going to come from some cayenne and something that we'll talk a little bit when it comes to diaspora food, but uh, a version of Iraqi curry powder, which is a very inherently Jewish spice blend. Fabulous. So as you get that together, um, and so we'll, we'll we'll see now how good your multitasking is, Jake. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what Jewish life was like for you growing up? I grew up in Queens uh, in the city, and it was a very, like, marvelous Mrs. Maisel, especially the second season when they move out to Forest Hills. Like, that was very much so, like, the vibe. Secular Judaism, tons of cultural Judaism. Um, and I always say in the book, we were high holiday Jews. We would, like, I had, my sister and I went to Hebrew school. It was like, you had to get bar mitzvah. Um, but really, it's like, we didn't go to shul. We didn't really keep Shabbat. But um, Passover, Shana, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, that's when we uh, we came out, um, but it wasn't until much later. So when I, around bar mitzvah season, we moved out to Long Island. So I went from being in Queens where it was just incredibly diverse. So I would say that my like day to day wasn't full of Jews. I feel like Judaism and Jewish identity was very much 
sectioned off and reserved for Hebrew school or being with family. And then I moved to Long Island and it all of a sudden became like, wow, everyone is Jewish. Wow, like this is just how it is. And from there, it really became, sorry, I just need to preview the oven. It really became something that caused that divide of understanding like what is Jewish identity and what does it mean? Because is it a big flashy bar mitzvah? Is that what it means to be Jewish? I didn't really have the other side of that um, in terms of being like forced to keep ritual, but I think the, the downside to being forced to keep rituals, oftentimes we don't understand the why. So when my, I met my husband and he, he's Persian Iraqi Jewish, I'm Ashkenazi, we both had these very secular upbringings. We started to explore like what, what's it being Jewish mean to us? And with that came this like desire to explore Shabbat uh, as just this form to not only like dive a little bit deeper into Judaism, but also to build community. Community is so, so important to us and something that we really wanted to like grow, especially being in New York. And Shabbat became that thing in which we were not only creating that space, but it was also where I started to cook all of these uh, Ashkenazi dishes I grew up eating, but had never made. Uh, and many of the dishes that Alex grew up eating um, that I had never even heard of. Hmm. So um, I know that, um, oh, Michelle, thank you for modeling, asking questions as you go along. Um, so let me just bring your question in and, and we'll get to mine in a minute. Um, so Michelle from Gilbert, Arizona uh, would like to know, Jake, at what age did you start cooking? So I like, I cooked a bit with my mom. Like she's, I mean, she, she had her things. I would say like she makes incredible latkes. But really, it wasn't something that came about until I was in high school. And that's when I really like started to explore pretty much a, a I would say like a, a short version of what I did again then as an adult with Shabbat. Of, of, I started throwing these dinner parties and I started kind of playing around with cooking and they weren't good by any means. I was a child just cooking, but it was, it was that kind of first taste of hospitality and community building that I really fell in love with. So for me, it was like an all or nothing. As soon as I started exploring that around, I'd say age 15, I just knew that that's what I had to do. And mm. I, I just went all in. Mm. So what was your journey as you, so you started cooking more and more as a young person, became a chef. How does one go from that to deciding to write a cookbook? So I would say writing a cookbook is always the goal. It's like, it's such an incredible privilege for someone in media. I worked in restaurants for a while. I was at Danielle and ABC Kitchen here in the city. And it was incredible. It was just something that I just quickly learned. Like I didn't want, I don't want that to be the end goal. Like I, I didn't see myself owning a restaurant or running a kitchen. So as soon as I kind of came to that realization, it becomes very hard to just stick in a career where you're just breaking your body. So for me, I had this like obsession with media from a, a young age. Like I am someone who grew up with, with Food Network and all of that goodness. So I, dove right in and started working in test kitchens, picking up recipe testing for different magazines and publications. I think when I started Shabbat and hosting it, it unlocked, it unlocked this journey that I knew I wanted to explore with a book because I do think a book is very personal and needs to have narrative. And when I obviously wanted to write a book, the thing was, it's like, what am I gonna write about? What is my perspective on food? And it's like, it comes down to the fact that I am gay and I am Jewish. But the thing is, gay people don't eat differently than everyone else. So that's not necessarily a lens that I wanted to lean into. However, as I started to explore Shabbat and Judaism, even through a queer lens, it became very clear that like everything in my life, when it comes to my values, my views on hospitality, my mannerisms, whether big or small, it's impacted by Judaism. And I just think it was just never 
presented me in that way because it was always very much something that it is what it is because that's how it is. Same thing with like, like the, the age old fiddler, like tradition. And I don't think I necessarily had the tools to be able to recognize that so much of my life was represented by Judaism. And the more I explored it, the more I fell in love with it, the more I wanted to do more. Hmm. Um, so you, started, you shared before that you started out really kind of learning the recipes um, of your own Ashkenazi tradition and then yeah. um, getting to know um, Alex, who um, you, know, you have ended up incorporating a lot of Persian recipes kind of into your in, into your repertoire um, and of course into the recipes that are offered in Jewish. What was your process around kind of curating curating that collection of recipes? Yeah, I would say it's a simple fact that like at the very beginning, every recipe in the book was tested or developed at a Shabbat day. So really it came down to as we started cooking um, and hosting, it was like, how can I make all of these recipes both delicious, but also incredibly useful as a host of making sure that people don't feel like they need, are going to pull their hair out at the end of the night. I, I want people to feel empowered in the kitchen when it comes to entertaining, not just cooking. I think like, I think there's really like the old ratatouille saying like, anyone can cook. Really, that's like not the end of the world. How about hosting, when you talk about making multiple dishes, making a menu. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just like really, really, really key to balance all of that and it just became this natural kind of extension as we were exploring of, the, of these ingredients that seem so intertwined with the way i cook jake i'm sorry just we're having a we're having some kind of audio challenge can let you, me see can you mute the audio on the food cam yes i think that would help i think that might i think i might have just did it Oh, no. No. How about this? We're going to do... We're going to keep it two, and we're not going to have any issues, and I'm just going to go back and forth because that's the beauty of the hinging of we can show both. The beauty with hinging. I love it. Okay, great. Um, so while we're, we're taking a diversion from your cooking story and your Jewish identity story, people yeah. want to know what were you doing with that big pot? Ah, yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so this is going to be the tidy. So I just greased it up and I'll talk through. So we're cooking down, we're caramelizing some onions. That's going to take like 10 minutes. And then the sauce comes together really quickly. So when it comes to tidy, you need a few things. You need, this is my saffron water mixed with melted butter, the beauty of making fish. I get a lot of people all the time who want me to like make par versions of the tidy, which is traditional it's not traditional to have dairy in it especially with jews it's just my mother-in-law and alex's family they're iraqi jews that moved to iran and iraqi jews tend to be on the same level of ashkenazis in terms of uh keeping kosher versus persian jews which are pretty strict um so butter makes everything very delicious but especially when you make salmon you don't have to worry um this is a little bit of yogurt mixed with that which is a uh, kind of technique taken from tachin, a different Persian dish that's like a baked casserole stuffed with chicken and dried barberries. That's really, really delicious. Wow. And and everybody is going to get all of those details in the recipe you're sharing with us, right? Y yes, at least. I mean, they're going to get everything for the salmon and I'll give you the tahi too. That's not the end. That's totally fine. You can, you can have whatever you'd like. All right. Sorry. I didn't know I was asking for a freebie. Okay. No, <laughs> there's no, 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 no. Don't you worry. Great. Um, um, but yeah. So tell us, um, so besides food, um, what are other ways that you and Alex celebrate your Jewish identities? I mean, that's the, that's the, the thing about it. every Jewish ritual is tied to food in one way or another. Um, so really, right. is there anything it's, else? They, they, I mean, to me, it, it comes down to, I would say, other kind of pillars of Jewish value when it comes to like Tikkun Olam and, and community service in our neighborhood has become super crucial. Uh, so to me, I think that's been kind of the, the, the core of how I, we live our lives, it's that idea of like, what's, what's going to be our daily mitzvah. Um, and to me, I think that's 
something that truly has only come about through exploring Judaism and Jewish identity. And this idea, um, even like going through the last few, I listened to this like podcast all around like modern interpretations of, of the weekly the Parshat. And it's just like, this is the portion in which we're going through a lot of the rules and the rules around sacrifice and the rules around kashrut. Um, and there's this idea that like anything that's gifted from God has to be given back. Um, and it becomes this very cyclical cycle that really has embedded that community first kind of thought process in the Jewish people. So to me, that has kind of been at my core of everything I do. I think as a lens, I use food predominantly as that way to kind of support community. Um, but really it, it can be whatever, whatever is needed and however I can support. Mm, beautiful. Um, before I ask my next question, I just want to make sure everyone has noticed um, in the middle of your screen at the bottom, there is a hand. If you click on the hand, um, you will have the opportunity to type in a question for Jake or for me or for, for anyone for that matter. And as I said before, we're taking questions throughout. Um, Jake, anything on the cooking end you want to show to people? We're almost, I'm going we're, I'm to start to assemble the tadik and I will show everyone and then we're going to be able to go straight in with that. So really what I'm going to do, I'm going to pivot. We got our yogurt here. I'm actually going to pop off just for mm -hmm. a second. I'm okay, while he's some... popping off, um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I made an error before. Um, the hand is if you... Um, the hand is not what you should use. I apologize. You should use the question mark, which makes much more sense. You should use the question mark if you want to ask a question. So my apologies for any confusion. Um, so Jake, while you're assembling, um, let's let's let let's shift gears to LGBTQ identity. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I know a bit about your story. I, I know that um, you had quite. Um, a positive experience coming out. Um, so I would yep. love if you would share some of that with us and then share um, what would your advice be for uh, young queer folks today about how to best pave the way for their journey moving forward? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, something that was super crucial was I wanted to really always create content and create just this book around my experience because I think that a lot of very much similarly to the Jewish experience when it comes to the queer experience a lot of what we see in media is surrounded by trauma um, because it's very powerful and you think of, of I think I mean when I think of like the most iconic like G, like queer representation of movies I think of like prayers for Bobby and then all of these truly truly like terrible occurrences that then become documented in film as a way to help enact change and, and really work on, on people's emotions, which I think is great. But for me, I just never saw myself represented in media in that way of people who not necessarily had issues with their like family, but really it was just that internal struggle with coming to terms with the sexuality. And I think we're starting to see that today, but really what I wanted to do is create this book and have it be focused on the normalization of a queer Jewish couple. And I just, I didn't want people to blink. I wanted it to be like, yeah. And then at our Ketubah signing our, and with our families that were all present and celebrating us. And I really wanted a huge focus to be on just that idea that like we had the full support of our families and that should be something that, that we're like cheering on. Obviously like it, uh, it is, but it should be something that's expected. Mm-hmm. So you were spit saying before that, you know, every day you say, you know, what what should be today's mitzvah, which, you know, which I, I and I, I I love that idea. Um, so what have been some of your, your mitzvah, what some of your um, actions actions for justice that you have that you have committed to, um, whether so, they're daily actions or you know commitments that are you know multi days, multi month, multi year commitments. Yeah. So. As a community, in terms of like our family, of I am in the same. I live in the same building as my mother and my sister. We've been really, really active. We've fallen in love with this organization called Nine Million Reasons, which is one of the largest food pantries in the city. It just happens to be in our neighborhood, so we go and actually help pack up and give food to at-risk communities in the city, which has been really great. I'm on the 
board of directors for One Table Shabbat because I think that what they have done for me in terms of, of creating a, a space to feel like I had ownership over my Judaism and Jewish ritual. I did it at a time of a young Jewish professional that needed financial support to help execute that. And I want to help support that for the next generation of Jews, um, as well as I'm on the Culinary Council of God's Love We Deliver, which again, an incredible organization helping provide nutritionist um, tailored meals for people facing severe illness in New York. So that's been, those are just some of the things. And then it's the little things. It's again, whenever a nonprofit reaches out for me to do an event, sometimes do a fold, I'm like, yes, of course, whatever you need. Um, I try to waive fees for any, like I don't charge for any like Jewish organization. Yeah, and we thank you for that, Jake, we really do. So tell yeah. us what you're doing on the stove just now. Yes, and yes. Karen Yanowitz from Jonesboro didn't miss a beach. Karen yes. says, what did Jake just put What in the did pot? I do in the pot? So I layered, I showed you that yogurt earlier. Um, we're gonna get back to the, the salmon. So this is again, this is just the bonus stuff. So I don't feel so bad. So we have, um, I, I mix some of the rice with yogurt mixture, put it on the bottom, put on the rest of the rice and just drizzled over some water and melted butter. And we're gonna start cooking this on a low heat, but in the second. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the onions. So these have cooked down nice and caramelized. This is the kind of color you want because this means we've brought out all of that sweetness. And now we're gonna spice it. So Iraqi curry powder. This is one of the main things that I want to do with my work is normalize the diaspora. And the fact is, I think that too often we are kind of really set into Ashkenazi food as Jewish food and really Jewish food is such a broad and gorgeous and diverse set of dishes. So Iraqi Jews were crucial with the spice trade in India. So as a result, so much of Iraqi Jewish cooking is influenced by Indian flavors and ingredients, which they then brought to Israel and created things like sabiq, which is inherently a Iraqi Sabbath breakfast stuffed into a pita. So they had their own version of curry powder. Um, obviously, most people who are familiar with Indian food, like there's no such thing as curry powder, it's just different types of spice blends. Um, this Iraqi version is coriander, uh, two teaspoons of coriander, a teaspoon of cumin, a teaspoon of turmeric, and a bit of cayenne. And you can adjust the heat. I'm doing a half a teaspoon. We're just gonna get this nice and aromatic. And then we're gonna add in tomato. So traditionally I would use a six ounce can of tomato paste. You really can do whatever you'd like. So I'm actually going to be using today um, some tomato puree that I had left over. So I'm just gonna let it cook down a little bit longer. But really the idea, you just want a binder. Because now we have all of these onions that we're going to smother the salmon with. And I mean, this would be just delicious on its own if you put this on anything because it's like caramelized onions with spices. Mm. But the tomato is really gonna bring it together with that beautiful acidity, as well as we're gonna caramelize it a bit to add a little bit more sweetness. So Jake, while you're doing that, you can tell us, oops. Uh, if you could, if you can tell us um, how, what's your advice for people in um, preparing for a Shabbat dinner and you know doing all of the cooking, doing all of the cooking that you need to do while also being able to enjoy, be a host, welcome your guests, hang out with them. Well, I have a whole section in my book just about that, mainly because I think there's two aspects to it. First is mise en place. It's just having, it's just preparing, really like preparing and then kind of coming at this with like intention is key. The other thing is like, don't take yourself or it too seriously. And there's this act of dieno of like, it would have been enough. And, and obviously that's referring to the miracles of the Exodus, but I think it's a mantra that you really can use in your everyday life. So whatever you do for Shabbat and for hosting, it is enough. And I don't think that people should like beat themselves up or get super specific about how things have to look or be. Sorry, my child was just entering the room. <laughs> that's all, uh, listen, that's the world we live in. <laughs> it is, it is. All right, thank you so much. Um, Jeremy Garber from South Orange wants to know what kind of pan do you use for caramelizing onions? 
I'm using a nonstick tonight, but really it's like for caramelizing onions, doesn't matter. Cast iron would be great. Uh, stainless steel would be great. Um, only thing with the stainless steel is, uh, I feel I find that's better when you're deglazing somehow. We're really keeping this pretty dry because we're going to be putting this over salmon. So I tend not to use that. I would probably use a cast iron or a nonstick. Um, if it was any other recipe in which you're then adding a liquid, stainless steel is, is ideal. Mm. So what juncture are we at now in the process? So the sauce is pretty much done. I'm just going to let it cook down for another minute to caramelize. And then we are going to start... Um, we are going to uh, just get it all on the salmon and pop it into the oven. All right. And meanwhile, for the rice, what I did is I put a towel over a lid, and that's what's going to help um, catch any excess steam so it gets nice and crispy. Mm. I, I learned that trick from my father as a kid who is not a chef. He's a textile engineer, but <laughs> he taught me that when I was a kid. Um, a question from Carson from New York, New York. Um, Jake, can you describe a dish that has super significant personal meaning or symbolism for you? Yeah, I would say two. The first one would be the challah in my book, because I think it is something that took on new meaning throughout the process, because I changed the entire recipe when we went into, um, after the shoot, we were going into edits, because we this was during COVID, um, where the book was already shot, but when I, I did all the edits during lockdown and I started baking challah every day and I, it became this truly meditative way that I began to start to spend my Fridays and put some intention towards gratitude and a process and, and, and creating bread to break with loved ones. And I found that was amazing. And then on the other side of that, actually three, or we're gonna have three recipes. The second one would be my great, great Aunt Lottie's meringue cookies. And the reason being is that like, it was something that this book really helped me dive in deeper in terms of my family and wanting to ask those questions that I feel like so many Jewish people don't do because it's just about subjects that we don't talk about. So this is a woman who would come to every holiday and bring her meringue cookies and they were so delicious and she always knew they were my favorite. And it wasn't until she died and at her funeral that I learned about her history in the Holocaust being turned away from school in Berlin, having to wear a star, escaping to, to England to work as a mistreated maid while the rest of her family perished and, and coming to America to help build my family. And, and really it's when you learn all of this history and the story, they just like the idea around her baking cookies and continuing Jewish ritual and continuing with like just creating this family, it's, it's, it's a lot more meaningful. Mm. And then on the other side of that, it would be the kubba, which is an, a classic Iraqi stew of these meat and semolina dumplings in, in a, a sweet and tangy beet broth. And it's a recipe for my husband's family. And, and it's one that hasn't, hadn't been transcribed yet. And it was something mm. that if I didn't do that with this book in the next 10 years, would just disappear mm. as they yeah. leave the earth. And as you start to understand that like, it's so crucial to be doing this now because these are the last connectors to our family here, to our family there. And that is no different from wherever you are in the diaspora. Um, there is just that idea that as Jews have had to move, like, the people who can tell the stories of those movements are, are getting older. Mm. Oh, that is so powerful. So you transcribed that recipe. And as far as you know, that is the first time it has, that, that's the first time that it will be able to be passed down, you know, not just by word of mouth. Exactly. In this family, every family is very different. And that's the, that's the thing that's been so important is that like, when you think about recipes and authenticity, it's like, what is authentic? One family's authentic brisket recipe might have ketchup in it. One family's mm -hmm. authentic matzo ball soup recipe might be as hard as a rock, super dense, because that is authentic to that family and their story. So I, I really tried, uh, that was a huge part of why the book is is really like these stories around my family and my relationship, because at the end of the day, that is the perspective. I don't pretend like this is the, the book. This isn't the only way to make these recipes. This is my way. And, mm -hmm. and that's... And some people will relate to that and love it, and some people won't, and that's okay, because for every three Jews, you have seven opinions, and, and that's just part of the, the deal. Right. So was that always your 
your approach you know, to kind of how to share these recipes with the world that it wasn't wasn't only about sharing recipes it was about interweaving the recipes with the stories of where they come from and what they mean yeah i mean i think i'm just i love humor i love life i love personality behind everything to me food is not just food food is a story mm -hmm. food is a conduit for connection so like i said earlier if i'm going to have that emphasis be about hosting it's got to be more than just like make this yum i thought for a second spindrift was the, the secret ingredient yeah spindrift yeah a little yeah, splash yeah. <laughs> all right so what's happening next all right so my rice is going nice and hard so i'm just reducing that down to low heat this has now cooked down beautifully so take a look this is what we're looking for if you use tomato paste to be a little thicker but it's still the same idea we just have this like rough sauce that's going to just be able to like spread over the salmon and get nice and crispy in the oven which i preheated to 475. the last thing i'm going to do is throw in a little lemon zest and lemon is super because it just adds a beautiful acidity it's so great with um with any type of fish but especially in this one my mother-in-law said what they used to do this is an adaptation they used to like suprem the oranges to so take off all of the rind and cut the, the flesh into wheels to go on top of the the salmon to roast which to me was always like very much a um i don't know like that it's a very like dated jelly mold kind of, of, of mm -hmm. plating but i wanted to to kind of make sure to keep in all of that acidity but also make it a little bit more streamlined mm -hmm. so zest and then you save the lemon and you cut it into wedges to serve And does that need to sit for a while or no we're gonna go right into getting the salmon this is all good i seasoned it up with salt got some nice kicks from the cayenne and now we are going to intro sheet pan lined with foil let me just cut open my salmon so and i'm using all that Jay, can I ask you a question while you're doing that? Or are you about please, to know? Please, please. Okay. Um, so, so you've been um, you've been you know, doing some you know, virtual traveling since your book came out, sharing yeah. sharing your book with the world. Um, tell us what 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 what's a, a meaningful or funny experience that you've had um, with the book? Um, and, anything rewarding, meaningful, surprising? Um, you want to share? Yeah, so there are a few, and it was all around what I did was I was very keen on, um, and I'm just going to start spreading on the tomato and onion onto the fish. It's not a very pretty thing, but I will show you what it looks like when it's done. Uh, but I did, in terms of like a traditional like book tour, in lieu of that, I did a bunch of social media events. So I did 18 days of Instagram lives with different celebrities and chefs, and I really wanted this to be something that like was around people celebrating Judaism. And it was with everyone like I may have cooked with the, from the book from, with Katie Couric. And to have, I think it was really incredibly powerful when she talked about very candidly that her mother was Jewish and it wasn't something that she learned about until a little bit later um, in growing up. And now she's married a Jewish man and, and the idea of what Jewish identity can mean and how complex it can be. And it was something that's not really anything I've seen her talk about, but she mm -hmm also very powerful um, when I cooked with Rachel Bloom and her husband and they were really well versed in all things Judaism as well as all things in terms of the story and to see Rachel so invested in the stories of her husband's family and the way they, they cook and their kind of um, connections to the Holocaust and everything it was very much something that I related to in the, the way that you kind of take that on when you marry into a family, especially into another Jewish family, and you become part of that story. Mm -hmm. That was really special. There's got to be another one. That's great. That's great. I think those were good. No pressure. If another one comes to you later on, feel free to. Yeah, yeah. It. So, what you want to show us what you're doing? Yes. So we are literally slapping it on. I want all of this all of this onion goodness 
And yes, you could let it cool, but this is going into the oven right now, so I'm not concerned. It could be hot. And we're just gonna smooth it out. And I'm gonna pop this into a 475 degree oven and let it cook for about 15 minutes. That's really all you need. Okay. All right, so as you do that, let's um, let's switch gears. We promised people that we're gonna play a game and everybody would have a chance to win a copy of your book. Uh, Love so it. You, are you up for doing that? I'm always up for a game. Great, all right. Um, so this is a game um, that will um, help you and everyone learn um, a little bit more about Keshet's work for LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. Love it. Um, we're going to share two videos and have um, a uh, live, uh, presentation, um, no. each, of, each of which uh, is about a different one of our program areas. Um, at the end of each short uh, presentation, um, you will hear a statement, um, and you, Jake, will need to guess if it is true or false. Okay. Um, if you get two of the three correct, um, then one of the hundred or so, the over 100 or so of you who are on uh, this Zoom tonight, We'll win a copy of that book and we'll let you know who you are at the end of the evening um and jake we will be helping you out well i won't be but because <laughs> i do know the answers thank god but uh but everybody else here will have a chance to help you out so everybody will have a chance to vote as well and you can decide if you want to go with the majority or go with your gut uh if you differ all right so let's get started first we are going to hear from sam pepper Sam Pepperman is, there's, is, oh, that's from you, okay. So Sam Tepperman is an alum of um, one of our youth programs, which is a, um, a weekend retreat for queer Jewish youth, um, also called a Shabbaton. Um, we haven't he held these weekend retreats in person, uh, needless to say, for a little bit over a year. Instead, we've been doing a lot of online programs, um, but we will again. Um, so let's hear from Sam. Hi, Jake. My, Hi, Jake. Name, is Sam My name is Sam Tupperman, and, and I'm a junior in high school. My experience, My experience with the virtual shop at home was very special. It was very nice, was very nice to have a space that was not only accepting of both queer and, and Jewish people, actively but actively engaged in both aspects of my identity. There were programs, there were programs that directly talked about the intersection of queerness and Judaism, both the parts both that, that, that my class and, and, and the parts that connected. I also got to, meet, also got some to meet some friends. amazing friends. Being able to, Being meet, able other to meet other people like me, like me in a space, space that accepted us, allowed for me to, allowed for me to make bonds with them that I couldn't make anywhere else. Keshet is important, is important to me because of the unique atmosphere, atmosphere of not just acceptance, but, but inclusion. I wonder, I wonder how, many how many other people have felt the same. So Jake, so Jake tell me, true, true or false, in 2020, 2020 Keshet empowered more than 1,200 LGBTQ Jewish youth through their new online programs. All right, so Jake, um, you see here the you see here the statement in 2020 we empowered more than 1,200 LGBTQ Jewish youth through our online programs. Do you want to see how people are voting first, or do you want to just oh, share I'm your answer? True. You think it's true? I do think it's true. All right, um, let's see. People have been voting. Oh my God, this is so cool! Oh, I love this. All right, well, for the sake of time, I do think it's cool and I do love it too. But for the sake of time, I will share, you are correct. In 2020, Amazing. even though it was a very challenging year, one positive result was that we were actually able to significantly increase the number of queer Jewish youth we were able to reach, um, including queer Jewish youth who we learned had been wanting to attend our in-person programs, some of them for years, but because they didn't, they don't have the blessing of having grown up in the kind of home that you did, Jake, um, you know, were denied time after time after time by their parents from being able to attend any of our in-person programs. And so for them, ironically, you know, there was an opening in the midst of all of the closing of the pandemic because they were able to close their bedroom doors, log on and gain access to a community of peers and support and people who became friends. Incredible. 
All right, now um, we're going to hear from Shira Diener, who is the head of school at the Jewish Community Day School of Greater Boston, which also happens to, to be the day school where the little person who came up behind me uh, in my office a few, a few minutes ago is in kindergarten. Um, and she is going to um, share a few words about our education and training work with Jewish educators and leaders. Hi Jake. Hi, Jake. My name is Shira Diener, and I am the head of school at JCDS, Boston's Jewish Community Day School. And I am delighted to be here to talk about the work we've done with Keshet. Uh, what I want to tell everybody is when I took this job this year as a brand new head of school, it was really important to me that the school maintain its status as a place that has a real sense of radical belonging for our students, that every student feels that when they walk through the doors, they don't have to park anything about their identities at the doors in, in order to fit in. They should bring their full selves and not have to like zip up a use suit and pretend that they're anything but who they are in their fullest glory. And this also means that for children who identify in the LGBTQ community, they need to know that JCD is a, is a place that can be home. So how do you actually do this? What are the pedagogical strategies? How do you bring that kind of stance into your classroom and into the school culture. So we reached out to Keshet and I have to say this two-part PD that we offered to our faculty and our staff, which was mandatory for everybody to attend, was probably one of the best things we've done this year. In fact, at the very end of our second one, we had a student come out and share with all of the faculty and staff that he is trans and is identifying as a boy when everybody knew this person as a girl for um, eight years in the school. And this has just been the most positive, incredible experience for all of us as a faculty and I hope for him and I am grateful to Keshet for all of the help. So what I wanna say is I wanna end with a question, Jake, or to everybody, true or false, in 2020, Kesha trained over 4,000 staff and faculty and leaders in day schools, camps, synagogues, JCCs, Hillel's, and other Jewish institutions across the country. Incredible. Um, I would probably say again, true. though it is tabulating. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, what about everybody else? Let's give you a chance. If you want to vote, uh, click on the hand in the bottom bar. Do you believe it's true that we trained over 4,000 staff and leaders? Three more seconds for those of you who want to vote true. Okay. Now, if you think that it's false, that we trained that we trained fewer than that. Please click on the hand. So I will tell you, Jake, you got it right. Amazing. We trained over 4,000 staff and leaders at Jewish institutions nationwide, and those staff and leaders together serve more than 1.2 million people. It's All right. Inspiring. It's very emotional. I'm going to be crying by the, the end of the third one because these have been really, Excellent. really, really exceptional. And, and not because of the onions? Yeah, the onions. I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, now um, I am really delighted to um, welcome to the Shindig stage one of my dear colleagues, John Cohen, our Director of Community Mobilization. Um, and he's going to tell you and everyone a bit about our work to mobilize Jewish communities nationwide to support passage of the Equality Act. Hi, John. Hi, thanks, Adi. Hi, Jake. Uh, my boyfriend and I are really big fans, uh, particularly of the pomegranate barbecue chicken. Uh, yes. that has been, it's been made quite a few times over here. Um, so like Adit said, I'm Keshet's Director of Community Mobilization, and my role enables me to mobilize the Jewish community to support LGBTQ rights on a statewide and national level. 
Currently, we are working on building support for the Equality Act, which is a bill that would provide a wide range of protections for LGBTQ individuals in areas like housing, work discrimination, adoption, and so many other areas. And as many of you probably already know, the bill passed the House and it is waiting for a vote in the Senate. Part of Keshet's campaign has been using postcards, phone banking, tweeting, emails, virtual gatherings, and most recently, last week, we did a really great event with RuPaul's Drag Race uh, star, Ms. Cracker, and um, she was amazing. She was doing cartwheels and heels on her carpet. Um, and so in addition to providing speakers for Jewish institutions to educate and motivate the Jewish community to support the equality for all, it has been an amazing response. And 45% of the participants in our campaign have shared that this was their first time taking action for LGBTQ rights. Um, and even though it's much lower stakes because you've already gotten two right, true or false, through Keshet's Equality Act campaign, there were 500 legislator contacts through postcards, digital messages, and phone calls. I'm gonna say true again. Uh, oh, sorry. But you got two of the three I right. So someone three. will get a book regardless. But no, I am proud to say, and sorry, everybody, Jake was so excited to answer. He didn't give you a chance to answer. <laughs> um, false, our efforts resulted in over 4,200 legislature contacts. Um, our outreach engaged. Our outreach so far has engaged supporters in 47 of all 50 states. That's incredible. Even better. It's a, I'm glad I was wrong then. Yeah, I know that was better for dramatic impact. So thank yes, you. Of we, 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 did, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't set that up in advance. <laughs> um, how much longer do we have till we get to see the salmon and see and uh, learn your final steps with it? So I think the rice is actually ready. So we might be able to flip the rice and then um, do the show the salmon. Let me just take a little peek. I always love to, it's totally fine to get a little. Yeah, I think we're gonna go for it. We're gonna see, let's see what happens. Okay. I've been, I've been pretty good with these and not having a, uh, a mishap, but. All right. So while you're prepping for you're that, um, um, anyone who's in, anyone who's here who's interested in getting involved with the Equality Act campaign, you can click on the Equality Act button in the lower left hand of your screen. Um, I want to thank the many of you who made a donation to Keshet before tonight. Um, we so deeply value your support, and it is your support, it's your commitment and your investment which makes all of the work possible that you just saw represented. If you have not yet made a donation or if you feel inspired to make a gift again, um, we would love you to click on the donate button uh, this year, I don't have to tell you, um, continues to be a challenging year um, and we really look to our broad network of supporters who care that this work continues, who want those kids who are out there to continue to be able to access support, to access community, to access training that helps them learn how to be agents of change in their own communities. The training for Jewish educators and day schools and Hebrew schools and JCCs and all sorts of Jewish institutions to help create communities where all of us feel like we can belong. Um, so thank you again, and um, if you can continue to support our work, we would be so grateful. Love it. I see that something dramatic is about to happen, so that's yes. why I'm bringing my comments to a close. The toddy comes out. We've got, oh wow! Oh my God! I, this is this is very high tech. This is much more high tech than I, I could have ever been. Um, but yeah, pretty wow. good. I use it. My play was a little small, which is why I got a little ripple. But great, even color. It's what we're looking for. And then this should be probably, so we got that, which is good. And then that's gonna be going with this. So really this is done. What I'm gonna do now is I like a little bit of extra color. So I say in the recipe, if you really like some crispy bits when it comes to the onions, I'm gonna pop on the broiler for literally a minute. Now we're gonna be ready to eat. 
Mm. Now is one of those times when you wish the event were in person. I know, I know. This is one of my last virtual, uh, and I, that's a lie, I have so many virtuals left, but like I'm not taking on any more virtuals just because I'm just starting to have in person again, um, which is really exciting and it really feels like the end of like a lot of, mm. just the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and just for all of you to know, we um, we haven't forgotten that we promised that Jake was playing for one of you. Um, the you know, the first person whose name came up in the drawing actually already has a book because they um, they made a hundred eighty dollar gift in advance, um, and so we're waiting for a second name to come up. Um, but that reminds me, um, wanted to share with you again. Um, anyone this evening, not just in advance, also tonight who makes a gift of $180 or more will get a copy of Jake Cohen's wonderful book, Jewish, sent to you. Ah, and we have a winner, Dennis in Michigan. Woo! Dennis in Michigan, Mazal Tov. Mazal tov. Um, there was just something that I just needed to say, just based on that first, um, the first video with the first question, and it was the idea of like how important it is to have a queer, a, like an equally queer and Jewish space, which is something that I didn't grow up with, um, especially because I hadn't come to terms with my, my sexuality yet, and it was something that was very important to us as we started exploring Shabbat and Jewish identity was creating a queer Shabbat in which we were able to fill the table with other young gay Jews in the city and they have become our dearest friends. I think that it's been so crucial and we always actively try to have diversity and not exclude anyone, but at the same time to have a space where we could have people that are truly like mirrors of ourselves in terms of that experience of being queer and Jewish. Um, has meant the world to me. So I do think it's absolutely incredible that that people can experience that exact same magic. Yeah, and that's exactly what we hear from so many young people, including young people who grew up in liberal congregations in New York City or San Francisco. They, they still say, this is the first time I've been somewhere where I feel like I can be fully queer and Jewish. I mean, we, and we've done that. We've gone to we've gone to queer. We went to CBST for services, and and that's all great. But until you're just like having intimate connections with others that share that identity, um, it it's just it's just a different feeling. It's like finally mm -hmm. being able to feel. It's like a feeling of home that you really don't get otherwise. Absolutely, yeah. I I always say, Jake, that I'm really proud that we're able to create those experiences for young people. And I will be prouder when these young people don't feel the need to retreat from the rest of the Jewish community to find that space, that they yes. know that they'll be able to feel fully queer, fully Jewish, fully integrated wherever they are in the Jewish world. And so thank you, Jake, for helping to make that possible tonight, everywhere in the world, all of the time by being who you are by how you lead, the stories that you tell, the stories that you help transmit. Thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening. Um, and Jake, mazel tov on all of your success. Thank you. It's, it's, I think it's it's like we like I had touched upon earlier, it just goes to show that like queer Jewish stories are valuable and people would like to celebrate them and there is plenty of room for more. And I just think that I, like I said, like I am just offering my story and that's the beauty of this world is that there's room for everyone's. Beautiful. So let's let's see the finished product. Yes. So we got the tadig and then we have the salmon here. Fill it, finish it up with some scallion greens. You wanna be pretty. You get the beautiful little caramelized bits and it just creates the shell of onions and tomato that also create the most magical aspect, which is the fact that the leftovers are just like amazing. Typically I hate like leftover salmon just because it gets like very fishy, but the acidity and like it preserves the fish and it's absolutely perfect. Can't wait. I mean, I have to wait because I don't have it ready for me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I can't wait to try it out on my own as I'm sure, uh, as I'm sure is a feeling shared by many of those uh, who are here tonight. Um, so thank you again so much, Jake. Thank you everyone who has joined us.
Um, we, uh, this platform will remain open for the next half hour or so for those who want to hang out. Um, you can um, connect via video with up to six people by just clicking on their little floating square. Um, so we encourage you to connect with old friends, meet new friends, and thank you so much again for joining us tonight and for supporting Catch It.